Let's take a closer look at the wave functions we got by solving the Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom. Here they are. These are the actual functional forms expressed in spherical coordinates. Remember the wave function had three quantum numbers associated with it. These are n, l, and m sub l. n could go from 1, 2, 3, and so on up to infinity. l could go from 0 to n minus 1, and m sub l could go from minus l to plus l in integer steps. All right, so this is the 1, 0, 0. n equal 1, l equals 0, m sub l equals 0. This we recognize as a 1s orbital. Down here we have n equal 2, l equals 0. That's the 2s. And here we have uh, three values uh, for n equal 2 and l equal 1. We can have m sub l equal minus 1, 0, or plus 1. Okay, let's take a look, take a look at the 1s orbital. Here it is. It's a bunch of constants times e to the minus r over a. This constant a is called the Bohr radius. It's the collection of these constants. It has units of length. And if you put in those constants, you get a radius of 52.9 picometer, or 0.529 angstrom. And we'll talk about the Bohr radius in a little while. This is interesting that for the 1s, the hydrogen atom wave function depends only on the radial distance r. It does not depend on angle. And that's what you might expect, perhaps. When L is equal to 0, you have, well, let's see, the angular momentum vector is the square root of L, L plus 1 h bar. And L, L is 0. That means that you have 0 angular momentum. And therefore, you might expect it not to depend upon angles. And that's true. Let's take a look at the 2s orbital. It looks like this. Again, those constants. Um, and now we have two parts that depend upon the radial distance r, this term and this term. The e to the minus r over 2a, very similar to this, except you have a 2 in here. That's because n equal 2. And then if you do the n equal 3, there'll be a 3 in there and so on. Let's look at this uh, part in here. This implies that there will be a value of r in which this term is 0. In fact, that value of r will be r equal to 2a. If r is equal to 2a, this term is 0. So this term goes to 0, or the um, wave function for the uh, 2s goes to 0 when at a distance r twice the Bohr radius. And then this is just an exponential which dampens uh, all of that. And we'll take a look at this in more detail in just a second. For the 2p down here, 2p, n equal to l equal 1, uh, we have now an angular momentum, which means that we'll have not only a radial dependence, but also an angular dependence, theta and phi. And this comes from the solution to the radial part of the wave function gives the uh, spherical harmonics. So there you have it. So the spherical harmonics are very similar to what we had before. Let's concentrate on the radial part, which we haven't seen before. So let's focus on the radial parts of the wave function, the parts of the wave function that uh, depend upon r. We've already talked about how uh, the angular dependence appears. That's the spherical harmonics. So what I've done is uh, plotted these various radial parts of the wave function here. Excel spreadsheet, which I'll put on Blackboard. All right, so here it is. This is for the 1s. Take a look at what the 1s is again. It's just an exponential decay. The uh, It looks like the exponent will be 1 over e of its value when r is equal to a. So when r is equal to a, this value of r gives you about the right value for the, um, for the Bohr radius. This is just an exponential function. That's what that is, e to the minus r, e to the minus r. Now, for the 2s, we said that there's a value of r, namely when r is equal to 2a, in which the function uh, is 0. There must be a node there. So let's take a look at that. Here's the 2s. Yes, indeed, it starts at uh, high, but then it goes through 0. It's negative, and then it goes back up asymptotically, approaches 0. So that's a 2s wave function 
that 0 occurs when r is equal to 2a. And then there's the exponent um, exponential function there. So that's the 2s. Let's take a look at the 2p. Um, note that the radial part is all the same. As long as n is equal to 2, you have the same radial part. Uh, it, in other words, it doesn't matter what direction, what value of m sub l there is. The uh, radial part just depends upon uh, n and l. All right, so here it is. It's just uh, a little different here. Here we have a function that's linear in R, then also a function that decays exponentially in R. See what that looks like. Here's that. Okay, this is the 2p. So it starts at 0, goes up and then goes back down. So why does it start at 0? Well, when r is equal to 0, the wave function is 0. And then as r increases, you would expect a linear increase in the wave function. But then there's this damping factor, which will give you a decrease. So here's where that r dependence uh, is dominating. And over here is where that exponential damping is dominated. And right there at the top is where they both meet. All right, so um, that's the 2p, uh, and it doesn't depend on that. And we just go on. Here's the uh, 3s. 3s has two nodes. There's the 3p as one node. And then the 3d has zero nodes. It goes up and then goes back down again. All right, so that's what the wave function looks like. Let's look at the probability uh, distribution, probability uh, density for the 1s. Here it is. Here's the 1s. It starts uh, at 0, goes up, and then goes back down again. If you remember, for the 1s, what about this? Here, the wave function starts at a large value and goes down, so wouldn't squaring the wave function give you an even larger number? Well, we have to remember that the square of the wave function is the probability density. And to get probability distribution, you have to multiply by a volume. OK, so let's actually do that. Uh, here is um, our radial part here, and this is r. And there's a wave function associated with the dependence on r, the radial part of the wave function. However, um, if you take psi squared, or psi, let me just do it, psi star psi, that's a probability density. And now you have to multiply by dv in order to get the probability. All right, so we have a sphere. The volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. So as you go closer and closer to 0, r becomes closer and closer to 0. And in fact, at 0, the volume is 0. So dv at 0 is 0. And that's why the probability goes to 0, even though the probability density is large. OK. So that's that. So here we have an increase in volume. So the two, uh, two things that are happening here. One is, if you increase r, you increase the volume. But you're also um, increasing the uh, or actually decreasing the wave function because of the uh, exponential factor here. So this goes, this um, the volume will increase, but then when you square this, that's, and so there are two competing factors, and there they compete, and then they, there they, um, the exponential takes over, here the volume factor takes over. All right, so that's why the probability uh, starts at zero, um, for the 1s, even though the wave function is larger 1s. And here's the 2p, or 2s. So remember, the 2s <clears throat> had a, uh, a 0 here. But then when you square it, this will become positive. So you'll have uh, one node here, positive. And then the uh, 2p looks like that, and the 3s has two nodes, one, two, two nodes. Here we have the 3p has one node, and the 3t, 3d has none. 
All right, so that's a closer look at the wave functions, uh, in particular the radial part of the wave function. And then these angular parts give uh, values where uh, the spherical harmonics. Note that um, even though perhaps you might not have a zero here, there could be an angle in which the wave function is zero because of the angular part. In fact, this theta is the angle between the uh, vector and the z-axis. So when theta is equal to zero, in other words, where you have a plane along the z-axis, uh, this function will be zero. Same way here, a cosine of uh, 90 degrees is zero. So now if you have that vector from the z-axis be 90 degrees, the wave function will automatically be zero. Okay, so that's a closer look at wave functions of the hydrogen atom.